Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome wherever you are in the world. Welcome to today's events at Vicenza Oro, presented by uh, the Italian Exhibition Group. Firstly, thank you very much to everybody at IEG for inviting us all to be here for what is a series today of very important conversations and discussions around issues affecting the gem and jewelry industry, and especially all the different supply chains that feed into the retailer's ability to sell a product with integrity to protect consumer confidence. My name is Edward Johnson from Gemfields, and I'm very pleased today to be able to introduce you and have an initial discussion today on different perspectives for recycled gold. I'm here today representing Sibjo, the World Jewelry Confederation, and I'd like to start, please, by uh, inviting on stage Dr. Caetano Cavalieri, president of Sibjo, to get us started this morning. Thank you, Gaetano. Thank you, Edward. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, just to follow Edward's welcome. And welcome uh, to this event that we are doing uh, uh, online, uh, starting today the first of our seminars. Let me thank uh, Edward Johnson, Adi Shevani, and John Mulligan. Uh, they are obviously representing uh, their own uh, companies and organization. Uh, Edward Johnson is from Gemfield, Adi Shevani from Ital Preziosi, and John Mulligan from World Gold Council, but the three of them are CIBJO officer because they are representing uh, commissions and sectors within CIBJO in different capacity of president, vice president. Uh, what we are going to do now is giving you a perspective of the use of recycled gold from the Sibjo point of view. And gold is the element, the essential element uh, with other precious metal, but gold in particular, about the processes that has to be defined. And uh, we start, as Sibjo requested, to the international standard organization of which we are proud members to uh, start a consultation in order to have a formal definition which will be an ISO standard. I don't think that is the case that I will go forward because the gentlemen and the lady that are on stage are super experts. So again, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much for following us. And I wish you a successful event. Thank you. Grazie mille, Gatano. So, thank you again, everybody, for joining, everybody in the room, but more importantly, everybody joining online today. Thank you very much for your time today on a Sunday morning. So we wanted to discuss today different perspectives on the use of recycled gold. And again, just formally to introduce my eminent panel members here, immediately on my left, we're joined by Elice Vanni, who is the CSR director for Ital Preziosi, representing the view of a refiner, a gold and precious metal refiner. Um, also with me on stage today, I'm very pleased to introduce um, John Mulligan, who is the head of sustainability strategy at the World Gold Council, so representing the gold industry and all its varied parts. We also have online with us today Sakila Mirza, who is the deputy CEO and general counsel for the LBMA, the London Bullion Market Association. Good morning, Shakila. I believe you're with us on the line from UK. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. I'm sitting in a forest, so I'm going to cross my fingers that the connectivity works, but for now it's working perfectly. Thank you. We're hearing you loud and clear. Welcome from the beauty of the Norfolk countryside, I believe, this morning. That's right. <laughs> so, the nature of gold, a nearly indestructible and endlessly malleable and a reformable material, this 
makes it uniquely recyclable. And these circular flows of gold have been intrinsic and a key aspect of the gold market for hundreds of years, if not for millennia. So we're here to discuss then today the different perspectives and the standards that are in place globally for the delivery of recycled gold. So if I can turn first to, to John, who of course has been doing work on this, I'd say for many decades. Why has recycled gold become a subject of such recent attention and what has caused it to be perceived by some as being a problem or perhaps controversial? Thanks, Edward, and first of all, uh, thank you all for attending and uh, your attention. Thanks again to Sid Joe for facilitating this and, and the splendid team at uh, Vincenzo Oro. Um, yes, gold, gold is the, the recyclable or circular element of gold has been part of the market for many, many, many years, as you say, maybe millennia. Um, recently, however, when you've tried to introduce guidance or standards on what that means, what recycled gold is, and specifically what labels are attached to parts of the supply chain, there has been a, a, a proliferation to some extent of different definitions. So you have the OECD definition, which is very inclusive. Any material which is re-refined is essentially recycled gold. You have the LBMA definition, which is similar, although more granular, and then you have the RJC definition, which excludes uh, investment products for going into the refining process, potentially being called recycled. And then you have product labeling. And product labeling has sought, therefore, to introduce other terms, repurposed or, or um, reprocessed or other terms. If you use multiple terms and they mean different things, the challenge is the consumer gets confused the market gets confused, and you potentially erode trust. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that all the conversations we have today, certainly those I'll be part of, mm. are really about transparency and trust. Now, to avoid that confusion, that tension, if you will, between those different definitions, what do we do? What do we do as a, to encourage a rational, fair, transparent market? Um, and um, I'm sure we'll go into it in a little more detail. But the challenge is to provide a clear criteria which we can all agree on, which allows then the consumer to know, well, that is recycled gold and that isn't. And that is, frankly, um, where we are now. The challenge has been, in the meantime, with that tension and that kind of vacuum or confusion with different, uh, different definitions, various vested interests in the gold supply chain and often outside of it um, have sought to promote very particular positions. And that doesn't really help anyone. We need convergent, coherent, consensual definitions, which is what we're trying to work towards. Thank you. And, and you know, if we extend that now, Alice, to you, um, what is the perceived problem that we're trying to fix here from your perspective as a refiner? Okay, thank you for the question. So I would like to start saying that I begin to work at Ital Preziosi as a special project coordinator. And at the time, they asked me as a first task to define and to understand what were the various definition in the market for special projects, uh, sustainable products. Uh, and honestly, it was a mess. Uh, it was extremely confusing and I could not reach uh, an accent to that research, because going deeper, uh, as John was mentioning, uh, the problem was not only the different definition between associations, but also the problem of private businesses giving definition on their own, uh, that was making even more confusing. Just to give you an example, there were products called, called uh, sustainable products, uh, sustainable gold, uh, green gold, or uh, uh, ethical gold, and for my extent, some of them were just traceable material. So um, at that point, I understood that uh, we could not base on that definitions on our case. 
So we decided to stick with the definitions of the standards we follow. And of course, we are an LBMA good delivery refinery. We are RGC certified. So our may end, of course, our policies follow OECD standards. So we basically follow the standards that the definition of the standards we are certified. Mm. And um, but this is uh, uh, what I wanted to say is that there was lots of confusion, especially because as a refinery, we are in the middle of the supply chain. So we have to discuss not only with uh, the downstream or with the upstream and um, Luckily, we are, we are very lucky because uh, the vision of our CEO was since the beginning to make sure that we could give uh, a segregated product, uh, a traceable product within our premises. So for us, uh, it has always been possible to trace and have chain of custody material from one kilo to more. Uh, um, but the issue there was like uh, there were downstream companies, clients asking for ethical gold, and when we were asking what they meant, mm -hmm. uh, they were saying recycled gold. And I was like, OK. So if they were asking for that, it's because other suppliers, other refiners, were supposedly giving mm -hmm. this information. So uh, what we tried to do at the time was to make sure that the definition was clear. Also because for us, uh, it was kind of a difference because we are, as I said, RGC certified and LBMA certified. And both of them have like a slightly difference in the definition of recycled. Mm. So <laughs> depending on the downstream, if there was a bank asking for us recycled, of course, we were defined more LBMA definition. Mm. If there was a jury asking for us chain of custody recycled, of course, we were uh, following the definition of RGC that, for, for example, do not include uh, the investment products. Mm. So we have been segregating following, depending on the demands of our client, uh, the material. So this to give you a glimpse of the confusion. So being in the middle of the supply chain, uh, what we have been trying to do so far was to be the clearest possible, but not inventing any definitions, just making sure that our counterpart, especially if it was a jury producer, was understanding what we meant with recycled and what could be actually ethical gold, which maybe later we could discuss about. Thank you. So when I, you know, what I'm hearing is, is repeated terms coming in. There's confusion, and John, you talked about this. This doesn't enable the consumer to be confident in the product. Um, we're also hearing about standardization, and so maybe, Sakil, if I can bring you in, because, of course, LBMA has a responsible guidance standard for your members to be delivering of gold. So, you know, from your perspective as well, what is the problem that we are trying to fix here? Thank you, Ed, and thank you to the panelists, as well as, well as Sibjo for um, giving me this opportunity to speak. And I'm really sorry I could not be there in person today. Um, look, I'm not going to repeat what's already been said by John and uh, Alice. They've summed up the challenges and articulated the problem extremely well. I just want to add one point, um, just to help to emphasize the, the, the further um, problems that we see. So the LBMA's definition on recycled gold, as John rightly said, is closely aligned with the OECD. We, as our standard, are focused on the due diligence that is needed to ensure that recycled gold and who you are sourcing recycled gold from is uh, meeting the requirements of the LBMA standard. So our focus in terms of ensuring integrity in that supply chain is around due diligence. Then there is the focus around product claims, i.e. ensuring that if you are giving, um, if you are sending recycled gold to a, so, uh, to a client, that it is really truly cycled, recycled gold. Or if you are sourcing recycled gold from a supplier, that it is truly recycled gold and the product claim is what is leading to a lot of confusion or some confusions. Um, and so we need to ensure that we understand what is it that we're focusing on. LBMA very much focused on the due diligence. And again, we're not saying that we've got the due diligence standard perfect. What we are saying, we constantly improve our standards. So to ensure that any ambiguity, any challenges, so that tainted gold doesn't enter the supply chain, we ensure we mitigate and we improve those requirements and those standards. 
So just a point on that definition or that word that I've just used, tainted gold. What do we mean by tainted gold? Mm. This is where um, uh, gold that you wouldn't be able to get the full due diligence on, you rebrand it as recycled so you don't have to do the full due diligence. Or gold that is, again, I'm going to be giving an example, not suggesting it's happening in the, um, amongst the open refiners, but gold that is sanctioned. And sanctioned gold enters the supply chain by the refiner as recycled gold, ensuring that does not happen. Again, that focus on due diligence. And I can give you a whole list of other examples. So making sure tainted gold does not enter the supply chain, therefore mitigating that risk through robust due diligence. What is robust due diligence? That is where the OBMA standard supports it. Do we need to do more? Absolutely. Do we need to clarify what exactly is recycled and what is it that the refiners are doing to ensure they're mitigating those risks? Absolutely. But are we on a strong journey? Absolutely. So that's that, those are sort of my high level points, not dismissing anything that's already been said, but just adding to what they've already uh, uh, highlighted. Thank you, Sakila. And I think you sort of addressed yeah. the area where I wanted to go to next, and maybe I'll turn to those in the room, is is what has been the responses from industry and stakeholders. And obviously, you've highlighted the need for enhanced due diligence in line with OECD requirements. John, maybe I can turn to you for, for your perspective as, as how does SIBJO and especially World Gold Council address these issues? Thanks. Um, so first of all, I think... SIBJO was very quick to respond because it realized that downstream participants needed clarity. And, and SIBJO is, as is the LBMA, a participant in the, what we call the ISO process. The ISO process, ISO is the International Standards Organization, uh, and I won't go into too much detail, but it represents all of the national standards bodies. So, so uh, its core membership is over 150, uh, national standards bodies which define the standards for which business operates and products are produced. Um, and as part of that, ISO stepped forward and said, we will seek to develop a standard uh, not only uh, to clarify responsible recycled gold, but that use of that word responsible and the due diligence Sakila mentioned, to also actually define a baseline criteria for what is responsible gold. And so whenever now we're talking about recycled gold, we're talking about responsible recycled gold, when we reach this standard, just to let you know where we are in the standard, it's, um, it's been, I think, 14 months of conversations, uh, 10, 15 meetings involving experts from around the world. Some of those meetings go, for, go on all day, involve 40 or 50 experts discussing in detail what we can and cannot call recycled gold. Mm. What inputs into the re-refining re process can be called recycled, and what coming out of the re-refining re process can be called recycled. We have now reached uh, uh, what's called a draft international standard that's being translated and going out to those national standards organizations, including Italy, France, the US, the UK, across the world, for them to vote on it. So the recycled aspect is starting to, we've made some progress. We've reached uh, a close to, close to consensual definition. Um, if, you, if I will, I'll just describe what that means, that definition means. Mm. It means, as I say, at a granular level, you've defined all of the possible inputs and said this is what is needed for those inputs, whether they be scrap jewelry or uh, electronic waste or returned inventory, can or can they not be called recycled gold? And then what comes out of the re-refining process, um, can that be called recycled gold? Is it also aligned with existing definitions and standards of recycling? Because you want recycling to become a common practice if you're going to encourage circularity, but you, want, you don't want gold to be very different than other products and other materials. And luckily ISO have standards so they can be cross-referenced. Um, what it does is therefore allow that clarity by being very specific. Uh, and I think that's quite, quite important. It, I should point out it is more stringent than most definitions of recycled. 
Uh, for example, it excludes explicitly, somewhat aligned to the RJC position, it excludes um, investment products that are being reprocessed. If they remain investment products, they can't call themselves recycled, for example. And so it's quite a stringent definition. It raises the bar in terms of what is needed to call something recycled. Um, but nonetheless, I think because it sets the criteria, and this is international criteria, it isn't even just OECD criteria, it is criteria that if accepted becomes a global uh, baseline for all further definitions. One of the aspects I mention, again, in relation to Sakila's comments, is it is built upon the principle of responsible sourcing. Mm. So you can't call something responsible recycled gold unless you can already prove that you have um, gone through processes of, of due diligence and been accredited as so. So it's responsible recycled gold. And that, frankly, is something that doesn't really exist yet. We don't really have those baseline criteria. We don't really have those terms which allow us to then say, OK, we all agree. And that's kind of where we are with ISO. So as I say, the standards in development, but the recycled aspect is now fairly firm and, and agreed by a large number of parties. The thing we're working on at ISO now is what is responsible gold. And I think that's very helpful for, for many people who may be listening online or in the room who, who are coming to this relatively new, this separation between recycled gold and responsible recycled gold, which is the journey that we're moving towards. And Sakila, maybe to bring you into this, and John's already given his perspective on the main features of the pr proposed ISO definition. Do, do you have any, uh, anything to add to where he sees the ISO uh, standard at the moment and where it wants to get to? So nothing to further add in terms of what it's doing and the intentions. I think the intentions are clear. Uh, consistency, making sure we have a uniform standard that is used across the value chain, and that's really important. It's not just something that has caused confusion, obviously, as um, Alicia said, in terms of refiners, supplies, and clients, but it is from the upstream to the downstream, doesn't matter who you are in that value chain, everyone wants and needs that consistent definition, and that is the very focus of ISO. So I don't have further to add in terms of where it's going and the intentions, but what I do have um, to add is the implementation. Mm. And usually what we have found, at least through our experiences in implementing the OECD guidance, and there are other programs, industry programs out there, is ensuring that the implementation is also consistent. And that therefore relies on understanding the definition. And that therefore goes back to the point on education. What is intended here? What are the principles that we are trying to address? And I've, we've covered that you know, quite, quite well this morning. But then ensuring that our understanding is consistent in taking that definition and then implementing it so that we are all working with the same objectives, the same principles in mind. Because quite often where these standards or where definitions fall weak is when the implementation has been inconsistent or you start cherry picking. And that is not intended. And I do believe, and, and, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, John or Alice, that the, 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 the group, the ISO group, is adamant that, yes, once you've, you've, we've come up with the definition, that when it comes to the implementation, we are ensuring that we understand correctly in what needs to happen to implement. On that point, the LBMA, and when the final um, definition has been agreed and published, we will, of course, take that and understand what is the, where, where are the gaps in what the LBMA currently has. Ensuring that we can close those gaps and ensuring that we can improve those standards, working with the uh, stakeholders, and the stakeholders are our good delivery refiners, of course, um, other um, um, uh, stakeholders in, in the ecosystem, which also includes um, civil society, which also includes upstream, which obviously includes uh, a lot of the downstream, so that they are ensuring that we have understood correctly our graph analysis is um, meeting those requirements and that we have implemented it with the objectives and the intentions that were laid at the outset. So that's what we intend to do. 
And if there is anything that I've said or any feedback that people would like to provide the OB and Maid to ensure that we get this right, of course, please do um, get in touch with me. Mm. And, and we're here to discuss different perspectives. So, Elice, of course, I'd really like to bring your voice in as, as a refiner. So, you know, you're very much involved in implementation. You've also talked about the difficulty that you sometimes face when consumers or customers come to you asking for, quote unquote, ethical gold. So from your perspective, what are the main features of the proposed ISO definition and, and what are you looking forward to implementing? And what is perhaps more challenging for you as a refiner? Uh, thank you for the question. So before answering this specific question, I wanted to add a point. Sure. When you asked to John about what has been moving also uh, the need for this new definition, and I wanted to give it from a business perspective because what we saw, of course, and I'm very happy about this, is that the downstream has increasingly required more sustainable products within their supply chain. And again, another trigger point was climate change, carbon footprint. And so that has been the mix that made sure that the re request of and the demand of recycled gold was getting very much higher. The need of uh, have a, a lower impact in terms of carbon emission, especially from the downstream, because consumers are requesting big brands and companies to take steps towards uh, better, uh, having a less impact in terms of climate, biodiversity, and socially. But uh, there are always like a situation where these go contrasting, actually, about sustainability, because um, of course, like we got to a point where recycled was things better than mined gold. That was mm -hmm. still something that is uh, supporting livelihood of people upstream and has always existed. And without mined gold, there would not exist recycled gold. So uh, I wanted to give this uh, highlight, uh, remarking also what Sakila said, because when you have the split the definition of recycled, you have to understand that not all of the recycled could be responsible unless you have a company that is certified and under certain schemes that demonstrate that they undergo due diligence where what has been sourced has been undergoing a strict uh, due diligence process. And I can tell being an LBMA member and certified uh, good delivery refinery that LBMA has been making also the due diligence on recycled very happily more tough and on our case, we were already implementing, uh, let's say, more um, <laughs> intrusive question on recycled supply chain to make sure that we could have at least tier one and maybe in some cases tier two suppliers to understand and identify whether the material proposed to us was aligned with what actually what it really was. And uh, said that, uh, what I could tell is that for sure, as I was mentioning at the beginning, we refer both to RGC recycled definition and LBMA recycled definition, depending, of course, of the kind of counterpart requesting it to us. Again, if it is the financial sector or more the jury productive sector. And uh, for us, it would be a dream if there could be one definition. <laughs> because as business, of course, like uh, the more definitions you have, the more you need to be clear with your clients, explain to them what, why it's different uh, one from the other. And the clearest it is, the better it is for us, because we can refer to one definition and we can make sure that it's not that we say that, it's written and recognized officially, but by officially, official association in the industry. And also um, another point that I want to remark and we always, as a company, try to remind is the crucial importance of education. We are very happy if we decide to change the definition. Let's make sure that then there's support for the private business uh, in the industry to uh, spread the definition, what it is, and making sure that everyone is well aware and understanding what, what, what it is about. You mentioned there a, a dream, you know, one clear standard. I like yeah. that image. And I think, you know, we can see from your perspective, that's a clear advantage. Uh, John, maybe I can turn to you and see, you know, what are the main advantages of where all this work within all the sectors of the gold industry and, and, and different schemes, what, what are the main advantages of the work that ISO has been doing? So, so I, the, at the highest level, and I, I started this way, at the highest level, it should encourage further transparency because you start to define, as 
both Sakila and Dalice have said, define those inputs and those outputs in a, an agreed way so people can understand transparency. Transparency, frankly, is, is there to also then build trust. Mm. And so at the highest level, we hope that will occur. Um, at a, at a, another level, it also internationalizes this approach. At the moment, you have different segments of the industry and different sectors in different countries who have different priorities or different uh, perspectives. Um, and I think once you have this international baseline, you, that should be ironed out. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm also fervently hopeful that Alice's dream comes true. Um, uh, I think that going forward, if you have an ISO-compatible standard, the LBMA can say their, their definition is, is ISO-compatible, the RJC can, you've got a baseline to work from. So that makes things easier, and that should allow business to be simpler. Uh, you've, the conflict or the tension between client demands and responding to them are simplified. So I think there's, there's a, a lot of that that we hope ISO, the ISO process will achieve. Uh, I, to go back to Sakila's point, if I can, um, I forgot that the ISO, has, the ISO standard has three parts. It has the first part, which we're still working on, working backwards, uh, which is responsible gold criteria. Basically, at, the, at, at a baseline, what does kind of due diligence look like? Which, which the schemes, LBMA, RJC chain of custody, build, can build upon. Part two, which we have yet to work on, is the implementation aspect to avoid, as Sakila said, that ambiguity of how do you do this. So guidance on execution, on what is expected of what you might call the audit process. And that's something that's also needed to avoid, as, as Sakila said, previous um, gaps in how do you do something and make it credible and how do you disclose on it. So that's, that's but that will be part of the finished standard. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so, yeah, that, but it's all, ultimately, it's all about trust. Right. And I, I want to highlight to all of you, Sakila, Alice, John, you know, feel free if you have comments or questions that you want to ask of each other. You're so deeply embedded in this conversation um, that I think it's very important that you've talked about bringing it down to granular detail. But, of course, for many people, it's still, they're scratching at the surface of what this all means. So an implementation, we've heard that a, a number of times. Sekila, you know, you, you touched on the impl importance of, of implementation for M LVMA and your good delivery agents. W where, do you, where do you perceive the advantages in this new standard to allow for enhanced implementation? It's that point around transparency. What is it that we're all talking about when we speak about recycled gold? And currently, that's very much focused on the industry programs. And as you've already heard, there are slight uh, variances between the programs. But having that baseline, as John highlighted, allows for there to be that trust. OK, what are we all talking about when we speak about recycled? What, one thing I would like to sort of add in terms of that point around transparency is the need for data. So we have definition. Hopefully, we'll have the implementation um, guidance as well. It's then ensuring, okay, what is the data supporting a lot of what it is that we're trying to do? And we already gather this at the moment from, uh, from the LBMA refiners, where we have um, that granularity where we've broken down recycled gold into buckets. And so we are asking, and I'm sure Alicia can speak to this in a little bit more detail, we are asking every single refiner to give us the data that breaks down recycled gold so you can identify what are the buckets within the definition that we currently have in our guidance. Where this is going to help us with what ISO has come up with is focusing on those buckets, that granularity, and then implementing it. So we are gathering that data from our refiners to confirm what it is, what exactly are they sourcing when they, they, they refer to recycled gold. And that data will give that transparency that is needed and we, as I said, we already have it, but we want to further refine it, no pun intended, to ensure that we get that trust, that uh, transparency, so that when, you know, whether you are downstream, whether you are government, whether you are civil society, you have a much more of an informed understanding 
that this is the gold, this is the precise type of gold that has been sourced by these refineries. And obviously, the LBM has to publish that data to make sure that we can share that more publicly. So I don't know, I mean, Alicia, did you want to um, make reference to the data sets that you send the LBM currently? Yeah, as I was mentioning before, I was very happy because recently LBMA has been tightening also this topic and making it more detailed. Um, because every year as a refinery, we undergo uh, an audit process where all of our counterparts has been, have been analyzed to see whether the responsible sourcing has been respected. And on recycled, basically, they have been dividing it in different areas that, of course, will have to be aligned more if the definition of ISO will get through and be updated on the case. But um, for refiners, probably in the future, not in our case, because we have been dividing recycled material in different subproducts because of already RGC was requesting different differentiation of them. But maybe for some refinery, it will be difficult to have this differentiation, especially when uh, there, there are no segregation and uh, division between uh, uh, the different uh, definitions. But um, what I wanted to add, if I might, mm -hmm. is that uh, uh, what is important, and again, it's very, it's very positive that there is more focus on recycled gold because it's about circularity, making sure that we re-enter material in the supply chain without getting primary material. But again, um, my fear in general is when something is required and everyone then want that material and everyone want just that material mm -hmm. because I believe recycled gold or recycled silver, recycled material in general uh, is an easy answer of course for sustainability and the decarbonization. It makes easy the work for businesses to make sure that their impact on climate is lowered. But again, if tomorrow everyone in, the, in this uh, show or everyone mm -hmm. in the world start to request Recycled gold, I don't think that would be enough. And the other point I want to make is that the risk created by this over demand is that then you have a behind market of, uh, as we know, maybe some heard about it, elephant jewelry or other like uh, risky and shady uh, supply chains where that risk to enter the recycled supply chain. So my uh, point of view is that it's crucial to create a definition because for customer, it's important to have the transparency and clarity on what they're buying to make sure that they know exactly what it is. And, it, and the important after uh, transparency and the crucial part is traceability and responsibility again. As Salka, Salka mentioned before and I mentioned now, again remarking it because every time there is an over demand of a product, there will be somehow a part of the supply chain that will try to take the best from this part, but we have to ensure that this recycled material entering the supply chain is responsible and respect the highest standards on responsibility. And seeing this, uh, I, of course, like this is a session on recycled and I mentioned this before, but again, because we had many jurors asking for ethical gold, mm. meaning recycled gold, mm. I want to make sure that whoever is watching this and maybe feel this, what I'm saying, that Ethical makes some, means something else, and maybe there would be a need of definition for that too, because there's too much use of that. But what I can say is that we it's important to have circular economy, but it's also important to not forget the part of the supply chain without which recycle doesn't exist, yeah. which is the primary material, which is mined, which is demonized, which usually is uh, seen as uh, uh, synonymous of uh, uh, unethical. And it's not true because if you go in the newspaper online, you just find negative information on mining because nice information and good news are not catchy enough. So, and if there are, I don't know, anyone from the media here that want to talk more about positive mining, please reach to us. <laughs> I'm very happy about that. It could be catchy too. But the input that I'm giving now is that it's important to focus on recycled definition because of transparency, but let's not forget another part of the supply chain, which is even more important. I, I, you know, I, I, I can't tell you how grateful I am for 
you bringing that perspective in, especially on a personal level as a representative of a mining business. Gemfields is a colored gemstone miner, so we can never ignore and forget the impact and the positive impact that mining is making when it follows responsible business practices. John, your perspective. Sorry, and, and yeah, I think it's important, to, touching on both those points, to remember, we started commenting on it, that the circularity aspect of gold is, is a structural part of the market. So 25 to 30% of supply on an annual basis is from recycled gold. It's, it's been there. The challenge is simply to make sure that is as responsible and transparent as possible. When it comes to the wider discussion of different types of gold source, which is kind of, is it recycled? Is it n newly mined? Is it mined from... That the, certainly the ISO process basically recognizes the validity of all of them as sources. As long as they're responsible, demonstrably responsible sources, it deliberately does not elevate one against another. And frankly, I personally, also representing a substantial number of gold miners, um, uh, I think that's, a, as, as, as Alice said, it's a, a very hot debate, but sometimes it's a little misinformed debate. Certainly, was, when people talk about responsible gold, I say the gold from responsible gold miners actually probably has one of the most substantial uh, demonstrable impacts in terms of making change on, on climate infrastructure, you know, social um, development, etc. So, so it really depends on what you're looking for uh, and what, client, what clients or customers want. The challenge and the opportunity is to allow them to potentially choose without really entering into this sort of ethical versus less ethical debate. We want to make responsible gold uh, the, a kind of clearly understandable, transparent uh, material, and we want to define the criteria by which we're making those decisions. And, and Sakila, your perspective on this is, you know, how does the new standard and how is all this design f the demand for responsible gold, whether it's recycled or newly mined, how does that fit in with, with LBMA's vision and work? I mean, that's always been the underlying motivation and uh, objective of the entire program that we've been uh, focused on. We started the program 10 years ago and it's evolved and it's evolved hugely in the sense of where the standards are going and it's going in the direction of ensuring that the word responsible is truly understood and that the supply chains are truly responsible. And ensuring, in trying to ensure that, that focus, going back to my very first point, on the due diligence, mm. understanding mm. who your counterparty, who your supplier, your client is, but also ensuring that there is um, an ecosystem that we're all working, to, uh, working in. So the ecosystem, from our perspective, are obviously where we represent, what we represent are the refiners, but then un uh, understanding that governments and, um, as I already said, civil society, but that sort of demand from the downstream, that leverage that the downstream has, that ensuring that what they are taking and that what they are um, using is truly responsible, further supports the, the work that is being done along the entire value chain. So responsible is uh, front and center of everything we do, but we cannot do this in isolation. So that feedback, that scrutiny, that accountability is so important to support that ecosystem and ensuring that those standards evolve. And I know, I mean, recently I was asked, well, I say recently, a couple of months ago, I was asked the question that why does the LBMA constantly update its guidance? I mean, we are looking at version 10 of the guidance for next year. And the point they were trying to make is just have the one version and make sure it includes everything and it's the highest standard of them all, and um, you don't have to ever change it. And I thought that was quite naive. And the reason why I, I, I'm saying this is markets are dynamic. The gold industry is a dynamic industry. Businesses evolve, uh, strategies evolve. So we have to ensure that the standards are getting ahead of that, not behind that. And in putting a standard in place where we are achieving everything today, or at least, you know, the objective is to have everything in place today and never change it thereafter, doesn't mean that we end up with a dynamic standard. So this point around recycled gold, yes, we are 
coming to a clearer definition through the ISO program and grateful for that very much. So especially recognizing the emotions, the challenges that have been present in getting to where we are today. And that's a good thing, by the way, because the last two years, if anything, has shown that people are very passionate about this subject. Mm -hmm. And the emotions that have come through is definitely something that we should see as a positive because everybody wants to ensure we are doing the right thing. But also understanding standards today are based on what we understand of the markets, where we see the markets going and how do we ensure we can reflect that it doesn't mean that it stays static for the entire life. I'm not suggesting we start changing everything every 12 months because I can put up my hand and tell you it's a huge challenge. We we change our guide, we develop, not change, we update our guidance every two to three years. It is not an easy process. But you have to recognize that feedback that we get that, um, um, and, and it doesn't matter what part of the value chain you are or who the stakeholder is, ensures that we are constantly working for better, responsible markets. I, I like the way you corrected yourself there, Sakila, and said develop, not change. Yeah. I mean, this is, a, this is like an it. ongoing journey of continuing improvement, as we often talk about. I, 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 we're, we're getting towards the uh, end of the hour, so if anybody in the audience does have any questions, um, we'll come to you in a minute. But just finishing up, if we, if we can here on the stage, uh, Elite Shea, and I'd, I'd like to address this question to all of you, but specifically for you as a refiner, you, you know, you're a key actor in, in the whole process. You, know, you undertake the, the, the refining and the re-refining activity um, that is involved in, in recycling. So how do you respond to these current, current challenges and how, how do you think that you and other refiners might respond to the new ISO proposals when and if they're accepted? Oh, well, our response will be definitely positive because at the end there will be clarity on that. And so we will be able to apply the definition in the best way. Again, um, we have been, every time, even when we had auditors in the past coming, they were always, why you make your work more complicated than it is? <laughs> because uh, we always try, to, in our case, to be ahead of time. So um, not waiting for standards to change, but making sure that we were already aligned with our mission. So again, uh, the way we have been developing our business has been chain of custody segregated since the beginning. And since always we have been trying to give our clients the best options in basic, based on what they needed. Because today your clients say, yeah, I want uh, recycled, but without dental. I want to uh, recycle without uh, another type of material. When the material enter in our refineries, in our premises, we do select every single material and divide it, depending on the request of our clients. So uh, we are kind, uh, let's say that we are one of a kind, uh, kind of business refineries. But I suppose in the refining industry in general, businesses could struggle mm. in terms of making sure that they could divide everything precisely because if there's more definition, the definition will be more clear. There could be a change also on the demand, like customer could be more clear on what they want. So there could be the need of segregate and divide materials at that point. But I believe this will be positive in every case because mm -hmm. even though it will be a challenge at the beginning to make, let's say, practical change within the premises, I believe that then, as we always do, we get used to things and things get along. And uh, uh, the importance in all the cases is to make sure the final customer is at ease with what he's buying and is well prepared and there's transparency on this. And everything is aligned. Not that me, I will start to, buy, to sell it appears ethical gold uh, as recycled and someone else is, is talking about something else. We need to be all aligned to make sure that the material is not, let's say, abused in terms of definition, which usually leads to greenwashing or other like misinterpretation. So from our perspective, uh, I believe this will be more than positive. And again, maybe I've been doing these speeches a lot, but, and I know, don't hate me because it's on recycled gold, but <laughs> we are members of various association also. Recently, the latest is Cheap Joe. We became members. We are member of the Watch and Jury Initiative 2030. Mm -hmm. And together with this association, we are developing projects to demonstrate that even ASM or mined material is not 
uh, something not sustainable. Indeed, mm. it could be positive, even more positive, because as John said, there's not just climate impact, positive impact, natural positive impact, but it is also social positive impact. Mm. Mm. So again, sorry, I moved to that, that one, but uh, it was no. the last page. That was great, thank you. And you gave your own perspective as a refiner, but you also laid out some of the potential challenges that other refiners might have. And maybe, you know, to finish up, Sakili, if I can come to you, you know, the same question for you. How are refiners or others in, in, in the supply chain going to respond to these pro proposed definitions if and when they're accepted? For the refiners, um, to remain accredited by the LBMA, they have to follow the requirements. And this is both the GDL rules, the good delivery rules, as well as the responsible sourcing program. So what we are starting, and we've started scoping it, but we're going to go into consultation early next year, is understanding the changes, understanding where, what are the themes, where is the focus, where are the priorities for the next 12 months in um, developing our program. So that engagement from the refiners so that they understand what is coming down the pipeline. LBMA requirements is not an option for them. So where, yes, there might be certain challenges where some refiners may need uh, a little bit longer to implement those changes, it is not an option. Mm -hmm. Other refiners may find that the implementation window is shorter. That's fine. And we usually give um, 12 months for implementation and then if you need a bit more time, then it's a bilateral understanding of why you need that additional time. Um, but where we stand with the LBMA refiners, that where our goal guidance is today, they are following that goal guidance. Then you've got refiners who go over and beyond what is required. And then what we uh, try and focus on is um, understanding what is becoming a consistent practice amongst um, some of the refiners where the industry is moving and where those um, practices are evolving in a positive direction, taking that, updating our guidance so we can also, can you use the word drag, a lot of those refiners that are at the baseline to the next baseline. So that's what helps the OBMA's enforceability. As I said, it's not an option, our rules. It's mandatory. It's not a nice to have. It's a must have. And so that therefore definitely gives us leverage in ensuring that the good delivery refiners that any anyone is working with meets those requirements, whilst those requirements are a minimum, but what we try and do is raise the minimum every year, every time we issue a new guidance, and also allow flexibility for others to use and go over and beyond. And one of the topics we haven't discussed, and it's not for this discussion, but I just want to sort of allude to, is technology. Technology is evolving at lightning speed. I think we've all heard a lot about you know, AI, blockchain, and various other um, and developments. We also need to understand how these technologies, how these features can support the direction that we as a gold industry are going in, recognizing that they can also help mitigate, as in technology can also help mitigate the risks, but it's also making sure that we're using the technology in the right way to address a lot of those risk mitigations. So, Again, we have refiners, and we have something like 100 refiners, 60-something are gold. Mm. Some refineries are quite advanced in their adoption of technology and helping them with their risk assessment and their risk mitigation. Other uh, refiners are not quite so advanced. So, again, we are launching um, a platform next year called GBI, Gold Bar Integrity, where we are using that for refiners to send us data, send us information, Again, it's not an option. They're going to need to connect to this platform, but each refiner will have a slightly different um, timeline in terms of how fast their technology systems can speak to this. It's not just the LBMA that's working on the gold bar integrity. I'm going to let John sort of highlight what his um, members are doing. But again, it's showing connectivity across the supply chain on how these technologies are supporting both upstream, our refiners, and of course, there's a lot happening on the downstream as well when it comes to technology. John, I, I sort of hand over to you now. I, I think you yeah. described the GBI initiative very well. Um, but yeah, there was a number of initiatives, GBI being one of them, where we're looking at te how technology can support transparency and, and uh, frankly, in some cases, address issues which we really struggle with, particularly when you're talking about sourcing from uh, less formal sources. Can you actually start to track and trace, to some extent, gold, even though obviously 
it's an endlessly uh, recyclable product, as we mentioned. Um, so I, I think I'll leave it. I think, Sakila, if, if we were invited to, we could have a GBI session next year. But anyway, yeah, of course. Uh, uh, um, <laughs> yeah. what I would say, can I, if it's one word to finish off, because I know we're out of time, is over time, uh, you know, as I say, gold is indestructible. So the gold that's around now has been around, some of it has been around for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. All gold is mined, and probably over time, all gold will be recycled. It is part of the market. It is an intrinsic part. So if we can make both aspects clear, transparent, and responsible, we can move towards a responsible gold market. It's what the LBMA are committed to doing. It's what SIBJO is committed to doing, what the World Gold Council is committed to doing. And I'm pleased to say uh, what I think most of the organizations that we collaborate with, we talk to, we have that convergent commitment now. And I think we're, we're certainly moving towards a more collaborative gold market seeking to achieve these things. All extremely positive words, alignment and collaboration being critical in all of this. Thank you very much, Sakila and Alice and John. Uh, and I'd like to turn it over to the audience here. If, if anybody has any questions, I'm sure our panelists would be very happy to try to answer them. Whenever there are no questions, that means that the panelists have done a fantastic job at answering them all. So that just enables me to thank very much Sakila from uh, down the line in, uh, in UK. We wish you a fantastic rest of your day. Okay. We look forward to seeing you in person in the future. Thank you for teeing up for a, a couple of future discussions, one about technology and also one about GBI. So we have uh, future job prospects for the four of us, hopefully, <laughs> in the future for to continue this discussion. <laughs> Alice in the room, thank you so much as always for your perspective as a refiner. John, thank you so much for all the work to prepare for this session. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen in the room, thank you for joining. Those of you online, thank you very much for your time um, this morning, this afternoon or this evening, wherever you're joining us from. We'll take a quick break now and in 15 minutes or so, we'll be back with another conversation on different perspectives on traceability in the jewelry supply chain, bringing in gold, platinum, diamonds, and colored stones, and what the industry is doing to meet consumer demand around traceability of product. Thank you very much for joining today. I wish you all a very nice day. Thank you. Thank you.